like to thank you and uh, welcome you to the Grosse Pointe Library. Uh, my name is Dave Lamb. I'm the organizer of this lecture. Uh, I'd just like to thank you all for coming tonight. I uh, just want a few little announcements before we get started. I introduce Fred. Um, let's see here. In case you didn't notice already, there are snacks and flyers out front of the table over there. If you need any, just please get up anytime we want to get some. Um, there are a lot of upcoming programs we would like to share with you, and we hope you can attend some of them in the near future. Uh, let's see here. As many of you have noticed, we have a uh, we are going to be filming this tonight. So if you need to uh, use the restroom or something like that, if you're over here, please just go out that door over there and come back in. And if you're over on this side, uh, just go out that outer, outer aisle. Thank you. Um, if you have any cell phones, please silence them or turn them low, uh, low volume. And if you have any calls, just take them outside if you wouldn't mind. So thank you. Uh, Jeff over here will be filming for us tonight, so I'd like to thank Jeff for coming in and uh, presenting for us and helping us out. He's from our IT department. And uh, that's about it. And then, let's see here. Uh, let me introduce Colonel Fred Schwartz. Uh, he is from originally from Toledo, Ohio, where he enlisted in the Ohio Army National Guard as a combat engineer in 1977. He received his commission as a second lieutenant of infantry from the Ohio University ROTC in 1981 serving one year in the Ohio National Guard before reporting to active duty in 1982. From 1982 to 93, Colonel Schwartz served in the 9th Infantry Division, 2nd Infantry Division, and 3rd Armored Division. He had overseas <coughs> tours in Korea, Germany, and France. After a tour as a threat analyst at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, he left active duty and entered the Army Reserve. Uh, in the Army Reserve, Colonel Schwartz's assignments included the ground liaison officer to the 107th Fighter Squadron in the South Air National Guard. Uh, command and General Staff College instructor, and finally as the Director of Joint Operations for the Joint Reserve Intelligence Support Element in Selfridge. Uh, Colonel Schwartz retired from the Army Reserve in May of 2011 after 34 years of military service. Uh, Colonel Schwartz was a qualified infantry officer with a secondary specialty of strategic intelligence. Among his military awards are the Parachute Badge, the Expert Infantryman Badge, and the Merit Legion of Merit. He holds a Bachelor of Arts Studies and from Indiana University. The university. In his civilian career, Colonel Schwartz was the Supervisory Foreign Intelligence Officer for the U.S. Army TACOM Life Cycle Management Command in Warren, Michigan. His team of analysts provide intelligence support to all U.S. Army ground vehicle and weapons acquisition programs. He retired from TACOM in 2015. Uh, he's married to the former Ann Arnold Hopkins of Columbus, Ohio, and they have two adult children, Gabrielle and Eli. Uh, amongst his interests and hobbies, I should point out, Fred is an avid model builder. As you can see from the beautiful models, he uh, Create it over here for you. If you have a chance, come by afterwards and take a look at them. Uh, <clears throat> he also enjoys many military situ simulations, more commonly known as war games, and that's where I know personally right from. Uh, finally, before you guys think that Colonel, the Colonel is too militant, you should also know that he's a greatly respected and ordained deacon and, and clergyman in the Anglican Church. So, and with that, I'd like to welcome Fred. Thank you very much, Dave. Good evening. And tonight we're going to take a, a look at the Sherman Tank Program. The Sherman Tank Camp is going to be my favorite tank, and I've been studying armored vehicles for a long time, and I supported many armored vehicle programs that the Army currently feel, fielded. But believe it or not, out of all of them, the Sherman Tank, I think, is probably the best. And we're going to take a talk uh, on why. Um, one of the ways we'll do this is if you have a question, just ask it. Uh, this is quite a lengthy talk, so you'll forget it by the time we get to the end. Just go ahead and ask it. The, the Army way of teaching is to get the people involved, so I'd rather have a discussion than be up here talking the whole time. There's, there was a reason why I did this. Um, back when I was uh, the Supervisory Intelligence Specialist at TACOM, we had developed some methods of analyzing the threat. And we were going through um, developing countermeasures for the IEDs in Iraq at the time and working all these problems out. And we came up with some very good methods. And one of them was a stop called a stoplight chart, which we'll see later on, where we take a look at how well a threat could either not hurt or sort of hurt or destroy a vehicle. And we also looked at the threat in terms of what was the most likely and what was the most dangerous threat? Because they were not always the same. And one of the problems that the program managers always said to me was, look, I have so much time, so much money, so much weight, so much size to build a vehicle with. 
and I've got to trade some of those things off. And survivability was always a big one because we don't want our soldiers to get harmed. But it still has to do with its mission. And we always had a problem of trying to articulate to them what was the threat and how bad that threat would be so they can figure out how much armor or should they put it in the gun or should I put it in the crew size. Uh, all these things are a problem when it comes to building an armored vehicle. So we would paint a picture for them and I was called the box. And somewhere inside that box was where that design would end up being, where the design criteria would, would, would fall out. And that box was developed by what the threat would be. And we came up with computer models. We came up with all kinds of methods to do that. Well, if, if you've done any reading on World War II, the Sherman doesn't always get a, a, a good calling out. Uh, some people really look pretty down upon it. As a matter of fact, one of the books that does so is sitting up on the, on the thing that was uh, written by Belton Cooper, who was a warden's officer in World War II, called Death Traps. And in his opinion, that's what the Sherman tank was. I'm going to take you through an analysis that might counter that kind of general consensus that we put our boys into a pretty lousy tank. And you may end up thinking otherwise at the end of this, because we're going to take a look at some things design criteria, doctrine, how the Army fought, how much time they had to design it in, and the scope of the problem that the U.S. Army was facing in 1941, and how it drove the design of the tank that ended up going into combat. And by the way, it was on the winning side. It contributed to the victory. That's very important when you think about this in the, in the big picture. So we'll take a look at it. And what I did was, we took that analysis to see if what we were doing for our current day force actually worked if we applied it to something we, all, we know about. We knew what happened to the Sherman. We, and we could dig down and deep to see what the weapons did to it and whatnot. So that's why I did this, and it was kind of a way to take my analysts through from beginning to end. Because usually, frankly, intelligence analysts never see the end of anything, because we're looking way on the future. We end up retiring and going way before that end ever comes about. So we wanted to see if our methodology actually was working, and so we applied it to this, and that's how I came up with this. The, the symbol of the program manager, Sherman, I made that up. There was no program manager, Sherman, back in World War II. Ordnance Corps did it through a series of offices. Today, the acquisition system has an official office, usually led by a lieutenant colonel, a colonel or a brigadier general, depending on the size of the program, and he's called the program manager. So I just kind of applied that just so we had a neat little logo to go through. All right, things to keep in mind as we go through this and as you think about the Sherman. What was the state of tank development and production in 1939, and then what was it in 1945? And how long was that? That's not even five years when you go from the beginning of the war to the end of the war. And then the entry of the United States at the end of 1941 makes that even shorter. In World War II, the threat changed rapidly. So rapidly, it was very hard to keep track of. We couldn't see what was coming always because it was just the, the cycle of development was really fast. Throughout the entire war, for all aspects of military equipment, it was moving and moving quickly. Now, in today's terms, when we started a, pro started a program over at TACOM, to get it built it was going to take at least 10 years. You could fight two World War II's in that time. So think about that. These guys were faced with a tough problem. That's what the tyranny of time is. You might know that the enemy has developed a bigger gun that is going to go through this much armor, but you've only developed this much armor. Now, the time for you to develop the armor and the design criteria to get the armor to stop it may not be enough time to get to the field in time for troops. Because the war's happening, and it's happening now, and it has to be fought. That was a huge problem in World War II, again, across the board of all military uh, acquisition programs. Doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine is how you do things. The, the U.S. Army is huge on doctrine, always has been. If you've ever been in the Army, you get a stack of manuals this big that you're supposed to read in a week and learn everything, okay? That's how the Army is. It lives and dies by its doctrine. How it fights, how it develops things, 
how it goes to chow. The army has a way of doing it. And doctrine drove a lot of how this tank was developed in World War II. And, and why wouldn't it? Um, you you, you got to know where you're going in order to get somewhere, right? That's really what the doctrine does for you. Another thing was, no other country had to fight in two directions across an ocean. That's what the United States had to do. We had to fight in Europe, and we had to fight all throughout the Pacific, and there was a lot of water to get there that you had to travel over. That played a big part, again, in the development of this vehicle. What is the enemy of good enough? Perfection. The best. What the United States did, this was a conscious decision they made in World War II. We are going to make things that are good enough. We are not going to try strive for the best because we don't have time. Because if you keep striving for the best, somebody always has a better idea. You go back to the drawing board and you never get anything done. The British were screaming for tanks in 1942. Screaming. They wanted us to build anything and everything and ship it to them because they were fighting desperately in the desert and they needed tanks. And that's why they got the M3 and the, uh, uh, the M3 Lee and Grant. Another thing was the extreme need for rapid military industrialization. The tank plant over there on, uh, on Van Dyke was built in how long? Nine months. Nine months, it was it producing in nine months. It took 18 months to complete the, the plant. But in nine months, they went from a farm field to spitting a tank out the door. That is amazing because we had no tank production facilities at all in the United States at that time, which means we didn't know how. Well, part of the thing they did, there's a movie you can find on YouTube where they show how they developed, they were developing how to lay out the tank plant as they were building it. They were hand building M3 tanks just to see, well, maybe we need that grinding machine over there instead of here. And we need to do this process first before we do that one. They were doing it as they were building the, the, the plant because we had no idea how to build it. The only kind of expertise we thought we could apply to it was building locomotives. That's what we kind of thought was the, the, the process, which was why Lima Locomotives Works down in Lima, Ohio, was really played a big deal in how we were going to produce tanks. And the last thing was the Sherman was mostly on the offensive. This is very important when it comes to losses. What happens when you are attacking? Who's more losses? And why? Because you're attacking. You're exposed. Yeah. The defender's hiding. He, he knows the terrain, he's been there, he has time to prepare, he has camouflage, he's dug in all his equipment, and you have to go get him, which means you have to cross the field that he cleared, which means you're exposed. And when you're exposed, you can be seen. When you can be seen, you can be shot. When you can be shot, you can be killed. That's the kill chain that happens to a tank. So on the attack, all your vehicles are exposed, the enemy can see it, the enemy can shoot it. So that's very important to take into effect. Uh, as we go through this. At the end of this, we'll have a little discussion. So keep these questions in mind. How did doctrine influence the development of Sherman? We will talk about that. How did resources and industrial capacity affect the development of the Sherman? Because remember, we were developing this tank when we didn't have a tank plan. We were already on the drawing board before the Warren tank plan was complete. How did threat and combat experience affect the development of the Sherman? You will see changes of the Sherman program within a matter of months and half a year and a year's time as we started seeing what was happening on the battlefield. I'll ask you this question. Was the Sherman the best tank of World War II? How many of you would say that right now with what you walked in this room with in your mind? How many would say it was the best tank in the world? We'll see if those hands change by the end of this. And then, as I, and mainly for my crew at the time, was what can you learn from this? And there are some things that, that we all can learn from, from this program. I can't pronounce this guy's name, I'm sorry. <laughs> but this lieutenant colonel, he's a Canadian lieutenant colonel, wrote a really good book on tank development in World War II. And one of the things that he took a look at was what was the problem of the U.S. Army at the time as we started developing tanks and seeing tank warfare happen? We had no armor branch in the U.S. Army. So the U.S. Army, being the Army, said, you know, 
It's something guys ride on. We'll give it to the cavalry. Okay? But the infantry guys said, you know, in World War I, those big British tanks, the big lumbering things that looked like a rhomboid and with a track going around it, it was, they were supporting the infantry, so we went tanks too. So the army went, okay, cavalry, you developed the fast cavalry tank, and infantry, you developed the slow infantry tank. And we're done. We might see that that was a problem. Okay. And then we came up with the tank destroyer command. Who heard about tank destroyers? Okay, tank destroyers were designed to defeat the tank. The whole doctrine was developed, a whole table of organization, and a whole bunch of equipment was designed specifically just to kill the tank. That also influenced tank design, and the common knowledge is that it was to the negative. Because it was not the tank's job in World War II, according to the U.S. Army, to destroy another tank. It was a tank destroyer's job. Prior to 1941, U.S. Army print tank production. Uh, Sir, you have a question? Well, just when you're saying it wasn't the best tank, right? So mm -hmm. you're going to compare it to the Panzer and the Soviet models? We can do that. Um, I, I, I caution when you compare a tank to another tank, because that's yeah. not how tanks fight. Tanks, part, tanks fight as part of a team. Yeah. That includes infantry, artillery, and a lot of them. Right. Uh, when you want to do system versus system, yeah, you can you can take a look at say, well, this one had a better gun, this one had better tracks, this one had a better engine, but does that make a better tank? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but we will talk about the German tanks in comparison. Because all I was going to say is, on your first things, you were setting some of the things up with kind of disadvantages mm -hmm. or problems to be overcome. You know, like the Soviets had to move all their industrial production behind the Euro, right? Which probably is a bigger thing. We didn't have anyone at fighting us on our home. No, we did. Notwithstanding the fact that we did yep. fight two, two fronts. Yep. Which was a huge advantage. Okay. So remember, U.S. Army tank production was done at U.S. Army arsenals prior to 1941, and they were built by hand. They had a bunch of guys. They got out the rivers. They put them together like I put together the model kits. Okay. That's how they built tanks. How many tanks do you think you get done in a month? <laughs> Not very many. Okay. And that was a problem. Plus, we didn't have the money. Because guess what? What happened prior to World War II? The Great Depression. The United States was hurt. Okay. Remember, I said there was no armor branch. Infantry and cavalry were the proponents. And they fought each other. The United States Army is not a unified entity. It still is to this day. It has branches within it. And the branches are very parochial. I was an infantryman, and everybody else in their other branch was beneath me, as far as I was concerned. Okay, And it is like that the armor guys think they're the best, the artillery guys think they're the best, they all want everything, and they all demand, they all have their schools, they all have their centers, they all have their doctrines, and they don't always talk to each other. That's why there has been some initiatives in the U.S. Army with combined forces commands and the futures commands that force them to come together. It was pretty bad prior to World War II because there was extreme limited amounts of money, and money drives everything in that five-sided building, okay? which was built at this time. It was really built yet. But the politics for money were huge. What do you think infantry would want for a tank? How fast do you think the tank should go for infantry? What, speed? About this fast. So that's how fast infantrymen walks. Infantrymen don't like to run. They think they do, but they don't like these to do it, okay? They don't like to run. Yes? What does a cavalryman think how fast the tank should be? Fast as a horse. Fast as a horse. His job is to go out to a screen, find the enemy, and then scoot away, right? So they developed what was called the combat car. Light tanks, lightly armored, lightly armed, but they were fast. Because they could go out, spot, and get away. They could screen and they could fall back. The infantry built these big lumbering things with machine guns all over it because to them it was a mobile machine gun post, okay? That was the mentality of the U.S. Army at this time. Because guess what? The tank destroyer command is going to take care of those other tanks, right? we got General McMahon over there and he's designing all these things with a bunch of guns that are going to kill all the tanks that are going to be great on the road run. That's what the U.S. Army was going for. So it lagged in all aspects, especially mobility, lethality, and survivability. Those are the three main components of designing a tank. Doctrine in flux, 
There was a big part of the U.S. Army who were looking to the French, not to the Germans. Why was that? Well, who won World War I? Not those Germans, not the guys with the pointy helmets, right? They lost. Well, I should pay attention to them. Okay? Who won World War I? Well, the French did. They had the most guys out there, okay? Lost the most guys too. But, um, and the French de developed their doctrine based on artillery, the gun. The gun kills everybody on the battlefield. In World War II, 80% of casualties on the battlefield were caused by field artillery. Not by rifles, not by tanks, not by airplanes. That shell that bursts, spreads out a big cloud of shrapnel, that's what gets, in, that's what gets your infantrymen. So the United States Army was heavily into the gun. We were heavily into artillery, and that translated to the tank destroyer doctrine of towed guns that could be massed to kill tanks when tanks massed against you. Okay? That influenced tank destroyer design. Now, the artillery emphasis was good because in the Battle of the Bulge, if you were a private soldier and those Germans were coming over the ridge, you picked up the radio and you got four battalions of artillery to fire for you as a private. I'm not kidding. And that's what saved us in the Battle of the Bulge, here again, on artillery fires. So it wasn't a bad thought. One thing I could not find was prior to World War II was did the intelligence community provide any information to the designers of the tank? I find no evidence that it was done. Then, if it was, I find no evidence that Ordnance Corps cared. Okay? How the Army developed things back then was the guys, the, the Army says, I need a tank. They turn to Ordnance, they go design me a tank, and the Ordnance guys go run off and they design it with no input from anybody else. That has changed dramatically because of our experiences in World War II. We didn't have enough funding. We didn't have enough R&D, we didn't have enough infrastructure to actually do this. So a lot of this didn't even matter. And then what happened in 1939? What happened in Poland? Yeah, it was overrun in four weeks. Okay. The largest army in the world was France's army. It was overrun in how long? About four weeks, five weeks. Why? So Germans had a doctrine of, of uh, it's called, uh, the, the euphemism was blitzkrieg, but what it was, it was a doctrine of, of breaking through exploitation with a bunch of guys that had the initiative to do what they saw that would be best. As a matter of fact, they tried to stop in the German army, the higher command tried to stop the breakthrough because they thought it was going to be too much of a risk. But guys like Guderian and stuff, they did it anyhow. They kept on going. Okay. As you see, in 1939, the United States Army went, hmm, maybe we ought to pay attention. After France fell, the largest army in the world, they went, we need to pay attention. Things started changing. We started getting things done. We started building a tank plant before, in, in 1940. So, yes, sir? Just so you know, you're aware of this, that beginning of World War II, we had, I think, the 18th largest army in the world. Yeah. Was tiny. Portugal was ahead of us. Yeah. 350,000 men was in the U.S. Army. That included the Guard. And it was, it was tiny. We were still somewhat in that frontier cowboy <coughs> mentality. We, we, we became in our big army in World War I, then we stopped. And went back to our frontier small army mentality. Okay. General McNair's influence was high throughout the war until he was blown up in Normandy. Okay. He, he was a brilliant man, and his influence, because he, he headed the command that wrote the doctrine for the United States Army. And he was a very big proponent of the anti-tank gun. Was he, was he the father then of this uh, tank destroyer? Concept yes. That we used? Yes. You know, about what time was, was he coming to the forefront on, this, on the tank destroyer? 1939 and 1940. It wasn't before that. It was already being developed before that, but that's when the, when the final decisions were made and they went ahead. When you read the manuals, it's real interesting. They were going to train these guys, they were going to be elite, they were going to have, they were going to take their guns and push them towards the enemy tanks and blow them up and all kinds of stuff. That, those manuals were written all in 1944. The problem was, what McNair understood but couldn't develop right away was something to keep the gun mobile. 
and that's why the tank destroyer was developed. We did never, we did not really come up with a real good tank destroyer until the M18 Hellcat right near the end of the war, which was an excellent vehicle because it was fast, it had to be. Okay, let's take a look at the tank development from 1930. In a way, it's almost comical, okay? This was the first U.S. medium tank. Now, we already had tanks prior to this. We had the Light Ford tank, which is a little two-man jobby. You, you, you go see the video of it. They, they're like the, uh, the Shriners cars that zip around during the parade. They were tiny. And then we had the real big ones based on the British tanks. We had those in the 1920s. We never really developed them all that much. This was our first attempt at a medium tank. And it was just a test tank. Anything you see with a T is a test tank. Anything with an M is a tank that's actually in production. We had a 47 millimeter gun, which in 1930 would have been a, a, a pretty good gun. Uh, but we also put guns in the hull. Now, that gives you a lot of firepower, but what does it do to your hull? It gives you, yeah, it gives you weak points where shells can come in. We'll see this problem go all the way up to the Sherman tank. We developed this tank, but there was no money to produce it. So we did. But it gave us it gave us a start and we started looking at uh, how we were going to make tanks. Then we went to the uh, medium tank T5. You start seeing what the M3 Lee being developed and the M M4 Sherman. The suspension comes from this tank. What's called the the VVS, the uh, vertical volume suspension system. A volume spring is a spring that's got springs within it and the springs move up and down like this. That's what the suspension was. It's a very good, very good ride. Uh, made the tank smooth, made, it, made so you can gun better. Um, really good, this is the, one of the problems is it makes the tank high. But it was developed in this tank, the BBS. So this one got funding and became the M2 tank. If you go down to Fort Knox in their museum, they actually have one of these. There, there was only 94 of them produced. Um, in all honesty, this was really not developed to be a tank to be used in combat. This was a tank to be used to train how to use tanks and to learn how to use them. That's really what we were doing. Now, it could have gone into combat. And maybe in the 1930s, it might have been something. But in World War II, this thing would have gotten slammed. But it really was the 94 tanks was enough to develop uh, two tank battalions that we could use on maneuvers and practice and learn the doctrine and how to fight. Okay. But again, this one was an infantry tank. Notice that it had all the machine guns on it. Is that machine gun in the back sticking Yep. They had machine guns all around, 30 caliber machine guns. So it could mow down the infantry that's trying to run up and throw a satchel charge on it. That was the concept. Pardon me? How fast was it designed to go? That I... Not much. <laughs> and then we went into our, our really our, our true first combat tank, which was the M3 series of tanks. Um, this went into production because we couldn't produce it. It was not a hard tank to, to, to build. Uh, comparatively, it had a riveted hull. Riveting a hull is easy. You just roll out the armor, you cut it, you rivet it together. What does that cause, though? The rivets keep going inside. Yeah, the rivets can pop and go inside, and then the whole hull will fall. If the rivets come off, the hull's fall apart. It was a, it was a weak tank in that respect. Um, but you know what? The British loved it when they got it. They put them in the service, and the Germans were a little worried. Why were the Germans worried about this tank at first? Because that big 75 millimeter gun in the Sponson, the Germans had nothing like it on their tanks. Their 75 millimeter gun was only this big. And it was designed to lob a shell, a high explosive shell, in support of infantry. It was not designed to kill the tanks. But this one was based on the French 75 gun, the Model 1897, which was a great gun, one of the best gun, field guns ever made. And uh, this gun was uh, very easy to load. So the rate of fire was really high, and it had a good size anti-tank round. It could kill any German tank on the battlefield when it showed up. So the Germans were a little bit worried about this tank. The Russians used them. Anybody know what the Russians uh, 
nickname for this was? They put an extra crewman in it. This had a crew of six. They put an extra crewman in it, and I don't know what his job was. This was called the Grave for Seven Brothers. The, the British used both versions. They ended up using this one. They wanted a turret that was larger so they could put radios, more radios in it, uh, and we developed that for them. We did not use the uh, Grand Tank. What were the British using when they got these, before they got these? The British had uh, cruiser tanks. They, the British had three types of tanks, a light tank, a cruiser tank, and an infantry tank. And they had many variants of them. Uh, the Matilda was the most common of the infantry tanks, the Crusader was the cruiser tanks, and then they had a bunch of various light tanks. Um, none of them were very well armed. They had, when they went in the desert, they had two pounder guns, which was like a 37 millimeter, 40 millimeter type gun, really small. They finally went to a six pounder in their tanks. When they got this, they, were, they got suddenly outgunned which is why they liked it. And the 37 wasn't bad either. The 37 could actually kill most German tanks at the time. Does anyone know why we put the 75 millimeter gun in a sponsor and not in a turret? We didn't have the technology. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't have the math kind of down on how to make that turret ring to support a turret that would be heavy to support the weight of that gun. And that problem had been solved, so they decided to do this. Uh, this was an interim solution. We produced uh, over 6,000 of them. Its problems were the high profile, to be, you could see it coming. <laughs> and uh, um, it's, it, it, the riveted hull was really weak. We ended up developing a cast hull one right near the end of its production. But there weren't many of those made. But the British were glad to get it, and they said, send us as many as you can. We were producing these before the tank plant was finished. They brought in a steam locomotive to heat the tank plant in the winter. And uh, it had one wall wasn't even complete. It was open to, the, open to the world, and they were rolling these out as they were finishing the tank plant. What's a I, uh, RIA? Oh, Rock Island Arsenal. Oh, okay. Um, Rock Island Arsenal is where they originally were going to produce it, but it was, again, they were, that was all done by hand. All they had was old horse jets, and they were building tanks in those. So that's why they came up with the tank plant. Have you ever been in the tank plant? That place is huge. I mean, it is, it is, it is, a, it is a big facility. But at the time, I think it was the largest factory in the United States when it was first built. While the M3 was in production, it was declared obsolete. We knew it was bad. We knew it wasn't the greatest tank. We knew it wasn't what we wanted, but we needed tanks, and so did the Brits. So we put it into production, and in the meantime, we started developing what was going to be a 75 millimeter gun medium tank. The whole idea was to eliminate that pea shooter 37 millimeter gun and put a 75 